Good morning, everybody. Hi, how are you? Hey, 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 everyone. It is Hope Giselle. And I wanted to come and... um. I wanted to come and just kind of sort of give you all some morning affirmations, some good day affirmations to get the day started. I text I have a bunch of different things coming up. Um, and today I'm being honored as an HBCU top 30 under 30. And I was just thinking a little bit about that. And I was thinking about that for a couple of reasons because I remember being at an HBCU and hating every moment of it. I had to fight so hard at Alabama State to be recognized as a human being, to be validated in my craft, to be validated as a student in some spaces, and to receive an award where I'm being honored as a graduate of an HBCU program, um, just feels like a full circle moment for me. While I was at an HBCU, I found it extremely hard to be the best version of myself because I found it really hard to be willing to accept who I was in that moment. And for as much as I dreaded the experience and for as much as I talk about the negative experiences, I have to say that my education and those experience, those experiences prepared me for the life that I have now. And I'm so grateful to the experience that I got at HB, you know, at Alabama State, even though it wasn't the most positive socially or even educationally in some spaces, um, it prepared me for what the world was going to do and what the world was going to say and the things that the world would, you know, treat me like. I went to a high school that was very um, inclusive and that was very open and that didn't really have a lot of those phobias and things. Me and my, um, me and one of my best friends, Ayano, we talk about how we went to high school musical, right? Like we didn't really go to a high school. And considering that most of the high schools in Miami, you know, outside of the, um, college preps or uh, whatever the case may have been, they were all very like rough schools, good schools, but rough. And so we always talk about how we got lucky. and We went to like the high school musical of high schools in Miami. And so much so that like, I still have a picture of me and my principal where I am in a tutu and a black corset with like a top hat on. Like, it, you know, I was giving full Britney Spears circus moments. You know what I'm saying? And my principal is standing there smiling and being supportive. And it wasn't just for the picture. He was genuinely like that for me in all ways, shapes and forms. And him and my mom had a personal relationship, you know, like it was a whole thing. It was really beautiful. And so to go from an environment like that to the environment of Alabama State, which is very much so Bible Belt, which is very much so political based, which is very much so, you know, men are men and women are women and all the rest of y'all will get in line and fall in line and, and you know, do what we say do. Um, was a shell shock for me. It was a shell shock for me. Um, and being in a space where I felt afraid to express myself for the first time in a long time at a school environment was new for me because I was so used to expressing whatever I felt at school. Like school was my safe haven. Going home was where I felt like, you know, I had to kind of sort of tone things down and put pieces of me away. But when I was at school, in high school, child, bye. I was, I was my best self. I was the best version of me. I was the most femme and the most boisterous and the most, you know, all of the things when I was at school. And um, I just remember getting to Alabama State and for the second time in my life, I contemplated not being here. And I remember that though most of the social experience was horrid, there was an experience 
that really helped to shape who I am today. And so trigger warning for thoughts of unaliving and trigger warnings for thoughts of severe depression. Um, but I was at Alabama State for all of two months, right? I was at Alabama State for all of two months and I think that the pressure got to me. I was this little queer boy, you know what I'm saying? Essentially for all intents and purposes at the time. And I had these long braids in my hair and I was wearing these funky outfits and I was just like doing me because I thought that that was what college was supposed to be like. You know, I applied to NYU. I got in. I couldn't afford, you know, the dorm room fee, so I couldn't go to NYU. But I was determined to still have my NYU experience, you know. And so I brought what I what I brought what I was going to take to NYU with me to ASU. And child, that was not the tea, <laughs> you know, that, that wasn't, that wasn't really the tea. That wasn't the vibe uh, of that school. And they, they beat me down, y'all. Those first two months, they, they beat me down. They called me every name in the book. Cafeteria people looked at me funny. School police were treating me funny football players, basketball players, like everybody was just like feeling some type of way about this thing. Even the gays, like trying to make gay friends at school didn't happen for me until my sophomore year. So I went an entire year, essentially what it felt like being alone, you know, and just kind of sort of trying to find my way because the gays who, you know, would see me in the older gays, they would stay away from me because the culture of Alabama State was, you know, even if you were a gay, like you faked the funk, right? Because that was just what the gays did on campus. They faked the funk. And if they were overtly gay, they still kind of sort of faked the funk in certain spaces, depending on where they were. And I just wasn't willing to do that. And I went through a stage where I had never felt so alone in my life. I had you know, been experiencing a breakup <laughs> with my high school sweetheart. I was with him all four years of my high school career. And, you know, I was just in a bad place and I couldn't talk to my mom because me and her were in a bad place. And it was just all of these things. And I remember one day I woke up and I was just tired, y'all. I was just so damn tired. I was tired of it. I was tired of of, of of the school. I was tired of the administration. I was tired of not being able to get help. I was tired of having to constantly fight battles. I was tired of having to like every other day, like having to prove that I will beat your ass. Like it, there wasn't a day that went by, I feel of my freshman year where I didn't have to like explicitly state to somebody like, I will fuck you up. Like I, I will fuck you up out here. Like le don't, don't get it twisted. Ain't shit sweet over here. I will hurt you. And on one particular day, I just remember I did this social experiment and it was so funny. <laughs> it was so fun. I think I still have pictures. Of it. I, I got to find these pictures. And um, I did this social experiment where I tried to dress as masculine as I could. Y'all, it was an epic fail. I had like this oversized t-shirt with the word, like with all of these disgusting words on it. It was just like faggot and sissy and all of these different words that I wrote that people had said to me. And I wrote it on this shirt and I put on these baggy jeans and I put on my Air Force Ones and I had my braids. And so because I wasn't going to take them out, I just like braided them up like to the back and I put on this fitted cap and I walked and I did my usual routine for an entire day, but I did it in this outfit. And it was this silent protest. And I wasn't sure if anyone was going to care. I wasn't sure if anybody was going to see it. I wasn't sure if I was just going to look stupid. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure what, but I knew that it would make me feel better 
to put it out there about how these people, about how this institution was making me feel. And so I step out of my dorm room and you know when you do something that's different or you know that when you're a trendsetter, you know that when you like start something different from other people, your first thought in your mind when you realize that other people can see you is like, bitch, what am I doing? I look a fucking fool. I am really wearing a shirt with the words it on it. I got this shirt on. I'm wearing these baggy clothes. Like, what is going, what am I doing right now? Turn around and go back to your room and change your clothes. Go to your room and change your clothes this instant. And I remember I had to do away with that filter because it was just going to irk my nerves. Um, But I remember just like doing that. And so when I got out of the dorm room, I had that moment. I, was st- I stood in front of my dorm for like ever. And I was just like, all right. Once we put one foot in front of the other, we make our way to the calf. Ain't no turning back. So all we got to do is just get to the calf. And so I'm walking. And as I'm walking, I didn't expect anybody to notice me. You know what I'm saying? I didn't expect anyone to notice me, but everyone noticed me because I was out of character, right? I wasn't myself. I wasn't the boy with the long braids. I was the boy with the long braids that was doing something different, you know, and it was funky. And it was interesting to me how for the first time, I felt like people were disgusted with me for not being myself. You know what I'm saying? Like, people be so disgusted with you for being yourself. But you you ever notice, like, how people look at you when they know that you're off? Like, if you're a person that's, like, boisterous and loud, or if you're, like, a person that's flamboyant, or if you're a person that's, like, whatever. Like, when you show up and you're not that, people be like, bitch, don't come in here and not give us that zest. Like, we appreciate it. We gonna judge it, but we appreciate Like, what's wrong with you, you know? And, um... As I'm walking, everybody is like paying attention. And there are a couple of people who are taking the time to read my shirt. And nobody is really saying anything, but I'm seeing the looks of affirmation. And that kind of gave me the courage to make it to the cafeteria. Because I'm looking and I'm, I'm, I'm like, pressing and on, you know, I'm trying not to make contact with people because I still feel silly, right? Because this is not me. This is like who I am. But I'm looking and I'm hearing people as they think that they're out of my earshot say things like, damn, or, ooh, okay. Or some people even acknowledging like, that's fucked up that he got to do that. You know what I'm saying? And like some people even being like, oh, like that bitch, like, Yo, you know what I'm saying? And so that gave me the boost that I needed to just make it to the calf because that was the goal, right? The goal was to just make it to the calf and then I would be good. Now, I don't know if y'all have ever been to Alabama State. I don't know if y'all know how Alabama State's calf is set up. But in our cafeteria, we literally have a built-in runway, okay? And so when you walk into the cafeteria at Alabama State, after you swipe your Hornet card... You can either choose to walk on the sides, which are still a runway. They're just smaller. Or you can walk down the middle, which is the runway. And when you walk down the middle, everyone in the calf can see you. And I made the conscious choice to just walk down the middle. Because I was like, it doesn't make sense to make this statement. It doesn't make sense to want people to understand how it feels when they alienate you just for who you are and for them to not see the effect that it's having on you and the reason for why you're doing this social experiment. And baby, I put on my biggest gangster lean and I walked through the the middle of that calf And, you know, people snickered. I'm not going to act like it was just the most empowering thing ever. But there were a lot of people who, like the people on my way to the calf, got it. They understood it. And 
before you get to the place where you pick up your food, there's like a couple of steps and then you like walk to go and select whatever it is that you want to eat. And when I got to the steps, one of my theater sisters, I'll never forget it, Miss ASU, Miss Alabama State, Miss Raven Washington, she stopped me and she read the shirt and she said, <laughs> and she said to me, you are none of those things. And I understand that this is, I, I get what you're doing. But she was like, you don't owe it to anybody to prove to us that you can do this. If you are happy being hope, then be hope. Don't let these people trick you into believing that this is how you have to be, uh, that this is how you have to be comfortable. And after she said it, I got my food and I sat at a table by myself. And I noticed that there were people just kind of staring and talking and whispering and like people were talking about what the shirt said and all of this stuff. Because out of all of the words that I wrote on the shirt, I wrote the F word, you know, the biggest like word. I wrote that the biggest in the middle of the shirt. So that was the first thing that you see when you look at it. And I remember one young lady who I didn't know, had no idea who she was. She walks up to me and she says, you look so uncomfortable. And you look so unhappy. And she was like, you know, this isn't you. Like, why are you doing this? Like, I don't, you know, understand. And she was asking a genuine question. And she sat down at the table and I explained it to her. And she got it and she understood it. And then she took that. And she went back to a table full of football players. And I guess she explained it to them and they all laughed. They all laughed. And then they all made it their business to walk past the table where I was sitting by myself and say the words that were on the shirt. You know, like kind of sort of just like in passing, like just, you know, saying random defamatory things that were on the shirt in order to let me know that they didn't give a fuck about my protest. And so the next day I woke up. And even though me and my mama were beefing about something, we were beefing about some little disagreement, you know, but you know how things are with your mama. And so my mom calls me and I was on my way to the cab. I was still feeling gray. And I just remember she called me to like gossip about something. You know, she was just doing what we normally do, you know, calling me to fill me in. And I was like, mom, I don't, I don't feel like talking today. You know, like, I'll, I'll call you tomorrow. And she didn't fight me on it. She just said, okay. And she hung up. And after I told my mom that, I just remember, like, instantly bawling. Like, I remember instantly going into a fit of tears. And I was in the middle of the calf, so I was like, I can't just be in here just, like, crying like this. But... Like, I, I don't know what to do. And so, like, I tried to suck it up as best as I could. And I left the cafe and I went back to my room. And I hope Alabama State has fixed this because <laughs> the windows opened all the way up. <laughs> okay, like, let, let me be very, the, the windows opened all the way. So I hope that Alabama State has fixed, has fixed this. Um, they haven't had any suicides, but still, I, I think that, you know, they should fix this. Um... But I go back to my room and I open up the window and I had never done something that would be so painful or I had never thought about doing something that would be so painful in my life. The first time I tried to do it, it was pills. You know, I was just like, I'm gonna go to sleep and I ain't gonna wake up, you know. But this, I wanted it to be intentional. I wanted it to be a statement. I wanted it to be something that the football players couldn't, you know, turn around and, and, and use against me and, 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 you know, say it back to me in my face the way that they did the t-shirt. And I said, if I jump out of this window and I smack on the pavement, everybody on campus is going to hear it and they're going to treat the next hope, the next person, they're going to treat her better. Whoever is the next me, because of what I'm about to do, they are going to treat her better. They're going to act like they got some sense with whoever she is. And so I sat in my window and I just remember looking down 
And there were people walking by. Some people looked up and saw me. And nobody batted an eyelash. Like, nobody batted an eyelash. Nobody asked, like, what are you doing? Like, not even in, in, in the vein of being annoyed, right? Like, nobody, nobody, people looked up and saw me sitting in my window crying. Legs hanging out of the window, like holding on for just like the the nth of a of, of little bit of dear life that I had left. And nobody said a thing. And that just like made me feel even worse. That made me feel even worse. And it made me feel so... It made me feel so unloved. And it made me feel so alone. And I remember sitting up there for like, maybe like five minutes. I remember sitting up there for like five minutes. Just hoping somebody would say something. Just hoping somebody would acknowledge my presence and just hoping somebody would give a fuck. And I sat in that window and I watched people walk by. And nobody said anything. And I was, I was so ready. I was just like, okay, well, if they don't care, then why, why should I care? If nobody cares that I exist, if nobody cares that I'm sitting in this fucking window about to jump in, in front of one of the main dorm rooms on campus, you can't miss it. Then why should I care? And just as I was about to let go of that window, I get like this loud thud on my door. And it was just like this big loud thud on my door. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? And then my door just flies open. Boom. And it was Dr. Heitch and Mr. Ray. And they were both a part of the student affairs team. And they were the only two black men on the campus that seemed to give a fuck that I even existed at the time. And they busted in my room. And before I had a chance to even think about whether or not I was just gonna jump, Dr. Heitch grabbed my arms and like threw me on the floor. And Mr. Ray closed the door and they closed the window and I just sat there and I cried. I cried so hard. I cried so hard. And I just remember like them giving me the biggest hug. Like the both of them, like these two big black men just like embracing me and loving on me and showing me that they cared. And um, they just stayed there and we didn't talk. They just, they just stayed there, you know, and we, we, we sat in silence until I was ready to say something. And when I finally started talking and I tell, I started to tell them, they started to speak to me and they started to tell me about, you know, how they were there for me and this and that and just how I had a support system and, you know, things would get better and that they would do their best to make the campus more inclusive and all of those things um, to the best of their abilities. Just all of these, you know, really affirming things that it felt so good to hear for the first time being at this HBCU that I was supposed to be so proud to be at because I was black. But in the moment, because I was queer, because I was gay, like I couldn't be proud to be there because the black people who were just black didn't want me to be there. 
And I remember by the end of all of it, like when everything was over, I remember asking like, how did y'all know to come to my room? Like, how did y'all even know to come up here? Because I'm thinking, you know, maybe somebody did say something. Maybe somebody did care. Like, maybe somebody just went and said something to them. And, you know, nobody said anything to me. And Dr. Hyatt said, your mom called. And she seemed to be really distraught. And she said that she had a feeling that something wasn't right with you. And she asked us to come and check. And that's why we're here. And so it's so funny to me, like to this day, when I think about this story, it's so funny to me that my mom didn't fight me at all. When she called and I said, mama, not today. I don't want to talk. I'm not in a good mood. Like she didn't fight me. She didn't, you know, like say, well, what's wrong with you? Or, you know, she didn't pry. She didn't do it. All she did was say, okay. And hung up. But her being a mom, right? That, that thing that your mama has, you know, that connection that you have with your mama, my mama knew something wasn't right and she couldn't get there. So she made sure somebody else got, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. She couldn't get there. So my mama made sure somebody else got there to make sure I was okay. And to make sure I felt like a human being. My mama made sure. My mama made sure that I felt love in that moment. My mama made sure that somebody... My mama made sure that somebody gave a damn. And she didn't request it. My mama demanded that they care about me. Because if it was, if it was not for that, if it wasn't for my mom's intuition and my mama's love, I would be dead. I would have been dead on that campus. I would have been dead on that campus, y'all. I would have been dead on that campus. And so to be getting, to be having a full circle moment today, you know, and getting honored as a top 30 under 30 for HBCU students. Like I pushed through that shit that I, I pushed through all of that. Like I pushed through that shit, every obstacle, every, every hurdle, every no, I turned it into a yes. Every, like all of that, like I, I made that shit happen. I did not allow that those people to break me. I didn't allow that institution to break me. I didn't allow those teachers. I didn't allow those students to break me. I pushed through and I graduated. And not only did I graduate it, but I graduated as hope. I graduated as hope. I walked across that stage as the woman that I am. And I say all of that to say this. Sometimes you never know where the help is going to come from. You never know who is really thinking about you. And you never understand your purpose. So do not take your second chance, your third chance, your fourth or your fifth for granted because you never know who you're here to serve and you never know who you're here to be a beacon of light for and you're ne- and you never just you never know whose life you're going to change with your own experiences 
And so some people say I get on here and I talk too much and I tell all of my business. <laughs> Little do y'all know I only scratch the surface. But even with that surface that I scratch, I don't take it for granted that there are so many other little hopes in a window behind an acadome, sitting in a theater somewhere, contemplating doing something to themselves. And you might be watching this live right now. Like, let me tune in to hope because I feel bad and I feel discouraged and I feel fucked up and I don't take that for granted. But to all of my black, queer youth, my black queer kids, like, please don't let them break you. Don't let them tell you that you are disposable. Do not let them tell you that you have to go elsewhere. Do not let them tell you that your words, that your value, that your life, that your that your thoughts mean nothing because they do. Do not let them bring you to the point of making you feel like there is no other option than to not be here because that is simply not true. In the last year of my 20s, It's so ironic that in the last year of my 20s, in the last year of my 20s, here I am being acknowledged because of the same institution that almost killed me. Ain't that about a bitch? (laughs) Ain't that about a bitch? Those experiences that I loathed, those experiences that I couldn't stand, those experiences that made me feel so small are the same experiences now that I use to counteract the hate, that I use to counteract the BS, that I use to counteract all of the negativity that people give me, people who don't know me, people who want to constantly try to misunderstand me for no reason, just because of who I am, not because of the, not because I'm actually a bad person, but just because of who I am. And those experiences at that school helped to shape me to realize that there are some people in this world that are just going to not like you. There are going to be some people in this world that are going to walk past that window. There are going to be some people in this world that are going to choose to misunderstand your purpose. There are going to be some people in this world that don't think that you need a special group, that don't think that you need support, that don't think that you need safe spaces, and you have to create them anyway. You have to be yourself anyway. You have to say the thing anyway. You have to show up in the space anyway. You have to be the best version of you anyway. And you have to, you have to finish. Not for them. And hell, not even for you, but for the people like you that don't understand what we now understand which is that shit gets better. Things get better. That same program that gave me all the hell in the world followed me yesterday because of this honor that I'm getting. But the entire time that I was a student, they made my life a living hell. Things change. Things change. The circumstances change. You just have to have a little bit of faith in yourself and in your vision and in who you are and where you're trying to go in and where you're trying to be. And you have to solidify who you keep in your circle. It will, Sasha. It will. Be mindful of who you keep in your circle. 
Don't nobody got me like how I got me. Outside of my husband and my mama. And back then, I love you too. But no, don't nobody got me like how I got me. Outside of my husband and my mama. And back in the day, my best friend Sky, my baby Jason, my baby Jeffrey and Jalen. That, that was my support system. Those were the people that kept me grounded in a space that felt so small. My best friend Ashley, there were so many days where she had to keep me from losing my shit. So I say to all of you, as y'all are moving and matriculating, whether you're in school or out of school, or whether this story resonates with you for an entirely different reason, just know that it gets better. Because like I said, isn't it grand? Isn't it great? Isn't it interesting? Isn't it funny that the same institution that almost killed me with their bigotry is now the same reason that I am being named top 30, under 30, in the last year of my 20s. Before I go out, <laughs> I get to go out with a bang and I get to go out with a testimony and I get to go out with a story that I can share with other people to let y'all know that no matter how bad it seems right now, don't ever give them this, the satisfaction of being able to say that they got you to fuck up out of here. Don't ever do that. I just wanted to come and give y'all that message. It was on my heart this morning as I get ready to go to the reception tonight and as I was thinking through some thoughts last night as I was working, I just, I, I started to get like this overwhelming feeling about, you know, like why I was getting this honor and why and how it felt important for a different reason to me. Um, and I just wanted to share it with y'all. So take that with you today. I know it was a little heavy, but I hope that the message lands for everybody. And if you came in late and you're a little lost, you know, I recommend that you go back and watch this video after I post it in a second um, and see if it speaks to you. I'm about to get myself ready for the day. I got a couple of things to do before tonight. Um, and so I'm going to bounce up off of here. I usually do a get ready with me, but I can't do a get ready with me today because I just, um, I got to do a quick beat so I can't be on here talking to y'all today. Um, but I will do a get ready with me wherever I go tomorrow because I know y'all love them. Um, but today I'm going to just get myself ready and get through my day. And I hope that y'all have a good one. <laughs> All right, y'all. Peace, love, and hope. And thank you for those of you all who bought badges. I appreciate it. Y'all don't have to buy badges in the economy like, like this one. I know if you giving out money, child, it's because you really, you know, y'all fuck with the kids. So thank you so much for that. All right. Talk to y'all later.